Hello, I'm Bruce James, consultant ophthalmologist at Stoke Mandeville Hospital and a visiting trainer at Kwali Hospital in Kenya. Thanks so much for inviting me to your meeting to discuss gonioscopy. Gonioscopy often induces this sort of reaction in eye care professionals, and I'm going to try and convince you that it's really not too difficult. We'll discuss technique and how to interpret the view through the gonioscopy lens. But first, why do we need to look at the iridocorneal angle? I've listed some reasons here. The commonest is to determine whether or not the patient has a narrow angle, but there are other reasons. Trauma can cause angle damage that may make the IOP go up, angle recession, or down, as in a cyclodialysis cleft. The angle may also show abnormalities in other eye diseases, some listed here. Which lens to use? The MagdaView and Latina lenses give a superb view, but it's harder to indent the cornea and they need a coupling agent. A four-mirror lens allows rapid assessment of four quadrants and indentation. Also available are cheaper, disposable plastic lenses. The technique of applying the lens is usually straightforward. In these times with COVID, ensure that appropriate measures are in place to protect yourself and the patient. Make sure the patient is fully informed about what is going to happen to boost cooperation. A large object approaching the eye is quite a scary thing. Make sure the eye is well anaesthetized. Ensure that reusable lenses are cleaned with detergent or soap and sterilized, for example, with 1% sodium hypochlorite solution before and immediately after use. Have a coupling gel to hand. A fairly viscous artificial tear is good, not too runny, so it all disappears before the lens is in situ and not so thick that air bubbles are difficult to disperse. Ask the patient to look up and apply the lens. You can use one of your fingers to control the lower lid. Have an armrest available. Be aware that illumination of the eye will affect the pupil size and therefore the structures seen in the angle. Additionally, pressure on the gonio lens will open the angle. As we shall see, both these factors can be used to gain more information about the angle, but it's important to use them in a controlled manner. As with all examination techniques, it's important to have a checklist to ensure that nothing is missed. It's even more important now with COVID and the increased difficulty associated with eye examination to ensure that every examination is performed thoroughly to minimise the need for repetition. First, determine what angle structures are visible, go on to assess the contour and insertion of the iris, and then dynamically, usually with the use of indentation, note the effect this has on the visibility of angle structures. So these are the structures you're looking for in the normal angle. Here, obviously, is the iris, um, the ciliary body band, the white scleral spur band, then we come on to the pigmented trabecular meshwork, the non-pigmented trabecular meshwork, and the Schwalbe's line. So you can see that here going um, in the other direction, Schwalbe's line, non-pigmented and pigmented trabecular meshwork, the white um, uh, uh, line of the scleral spur, and then on to the ciliary body line, and then um, iris. In patients with narrow angles, the superior angle is usually the narrowest, so look inferiorly first. Rotate the lens too. Some sectors of the angle may be easier to analyse than others. Don't forget to use indentation. The narrow angles are often the hardest to analyse, as I say, and indentation will not only show whether um, peripheral anterior synechae are present, but may reveal angle structures, notably the scleral spur, which make it easier to understand what is going on. Sometimes things can be hard though, and there are various techniques that can help demonstrate um, what, what is going on. So the corneal wedge technique, using the slit lamp, a narrow, short beam, uh, bright, and at about 10 to 15 degrees to the microscope. What you're trying to see is this wedge pattern, um, and the anterior um, arm of the wedge is formed by the reflection from the corneoscleral junction. The um, posterior um, arm of the wedge is formed by the reflection from the corneal endothelium. And where those two meet, it should get a little bit brighter, as you can see here, and that gives you an indication of where Schwalbe's line is. Practically speaking, I always find that if I can identify the scleral spur, then I can normally work out what else is going on. So I always look for the scleral spur first. And don't forget, that may mean indentation. The scleral spur is normally the whitest line. 
Practice will allow you to become familiar with normal appearances and variants, and some of the variants we'll just discuss. These are iris processes, strands from the iris to the meshwork, but they don't cross the meshwork, and you can see them here, some thick, some thin. Various patterns of blood vessels may also be present when you look at the angle, and these may be entirely normal. Note, though, that normal vessels don't normally cross Schwalbe's line up here. You want to assess the contour of the iris. Is it flat, bowed forward, as in this case, and you can see here um, on this OBM picture of someone with very narrow angles, how the iris appears to be bowed forwards. The usual position in open angles and, and um, normalized is that the iris plane is fairly flat. You may see that it's actually bowed backwards, for example, in patients with pigment dispersion. Assess the insertion of the iris. Is there a normal theory body band or does the iris appear to insert anterior to this? Don't forget this dynamic assessment of the angle. To stress again, this can be extremely helpful in identifying angle structures and is essential in determining whether there is appositional iridotrabecular meshwork contact or with a peripheral anterior synechia present. Indentation moves the iris away from the angle if there's just contact, but clearly won't be able to move the angle if it's actually stuck in peripheral anterior synechi. Just a quick word on grading systems. I think these often put people off. There are many different grading systems. Frankly, I think it's best to describe what you see. State in each of the four quadrants what angle structures you can see, state the iris configuration as we've just discussed, where it appears inserted, and discuss the effect of dynamic gonioscopy. You've then got a pretty comprehensive view of what's going on that everyone will understand. The classification system uh, is for narrow angles requires accurate gonioscopy and accurate recording of uh, findings. So let's now look at once you have normal angles. Here's an example of peripheral anterior synechi. This is a traumatic case. The angle here is actually quite widely open. There's the um, scleral spur. But here you can see that the iris has come right forward um, uh, anterior uh, to Schwalbe's line. This is a very pigmented angle seen in a patient with pigment dispersion glaucoma. You can see the pigment um, here on the trabecular meshwork. This is an example of two patients with a cyclodialysis cleft, and you can see this large cavity opening here, and in this one again, the arrows demonstrate uh, the positions of the cleft. This is caused by trauma, where the angles opened up, causing a communication between the anterior chamber and the potential space between choroid and sclera. This usually causes a low pressure. Damage to the trabecular meshwork itself or angle recession may cause an elevated pressure. It's important um, to remember, as with any other part of history, that when you have found an abnormality, always ask, what else can I do to confirm my diagnosis? So here's a shallow anterior chamber, so you might expect to find that there's um, a narrow iridocorneal angle. If there's a narrow iridocorneal angle only in one sector, then just think is there a posterior chamber mass that's actually pressing the iris forwards? If you see abnormal vessels in the iris here, um, there actually are peripheral anterior synechi and a blood vessel running here, but look at the rest of the iris to see if there's evidence of rubiosis there. So in conclusion, gonioscopy need not be frightening. Inform the patient about what's going to happen, apply local anaesthetic, use a sterilized lens, ensure the correct conditions, for example, dim light are present, assess systematically, identify landmarks, record your findings systematically. Practice will make perfect. Thank you very much.